thank you so much, uh, God's servant, for inviting me this morning. And we thank God for the connections, the great blessing that God has given us to meet this weekend. And we thank God. Well, it's my first time in Geneva since Adam. <laughs> you remember the days of Adam and Eve? Yes. <laughs> so I've never been here since Adam, but I've been to, I've been to Switzerland, other parts of Switzerland for many years. Uh, Barcelona and Zurich and Lisa, Chicago, and Pia, and the cities, and the Gladus, the mountain here. There is a Gladus, I've done, done some meetings there twice. And uh, very powerful things that did happen. But I've never been this part of, of Geneva, but I bless the Lord. And this is the day the Lord has made. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Now, I just want to mention something about this uh, statement the goal of preaching the gospel, bringing the gospel to, uh, of Jesus Christ to the greatest number of people at the shortest possible time, using all means, immediate time is possible. This is great. This is how I got to know the Johann Marshall Mission. In 1996, I came across a pamphlet, a uh, newsletter, not the magazine, but a little newsletter, with the stories about uh, Zaire, which is now DRC Congo. And I read that and I saw this statement and it inspired me, you know, using all means possible. I mean, this inspired me so greatly, and I decided to write a letter to to your aunt, to say I like your mission, I like the vision of your ministry, I like the pictures I'm seeing in Congo. And uh, after several months, I received a letter from uh, David because you know the father then was a little old and could write. Uh, and uh, I replied a year later, we wrote another one letter and uh, replied. So kind of we kept a very basic communication once a year. And then one time I asked them, can you come to Nairobi? And uh, later I got a fax and they said, I'm gonna send uh, uh, my brother John to Nairobi, he's gonna come and he can do meetings with you, which happened in 1998. And uh, from that time in 98 to date, we related and connected mm -hmm. with this mission mm -hmm. and it's been a great blessing. Mm -hmm. and so I'm so glad to be here today. I want you to know that I love Jesus, I'm born again. I'm a saved preacher. Uh, these days you can't be sure who is who. Uh, I want you to know that I gave my life to Jesus when I had the gospel in Africa in 1975, in our village, in the middle of somewhere. We can't say nowhere, we say somewhere. Praise the Lord. And uh, Glory to God. the good news of Christ came to my family. My daddy used to be an alcoholic and my mother, uh, our village was a little brewery. Everybody used to come and get some local brew and oh. you know, it was a total mess and the family was in shambles. <laughs> father fighting mother, everybody. When we hear my father coming drink, drunk to singing at night, we disappear. <laughs> <laughs> because that would be battles. <laughs> but one day he slept and he woke up with a dream and the dream told him, follow this road. And the first church you find joy. Wow. Thank God for churches that have signposts. So he walked down the road when he woke up, found a church, he went in, had the gospel, and gave his life to Jesus. Amen. Wow. After a month, the church came to the village house to do follow up. And then we had this fellowship. And on that day, my mother got saved, one of my brothers got saved, I also got saved. Actually, me, I didn't have a reason to get saved. I saw my brother getting saved. We were nine years. He was, you know, 11 years. We used to fight as little boys and, you know, played too much. So when I saw him go forward to receive Christ, and the preacher kept saying, somebody else who wants to receive Christ, come. Mm -hmm. I said, whatever is good for that young man, I think it's good for me. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have a reason. So I just went forward and gave my life to Christ. But guess what? It worked. Mm -hmm. It worked. Mm -hmm. The power of God touched me. And today, by God's grace, He's raised me up to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ everywhere we go. And we thank God for that blessing today. Well, uh, 
You don't mind what you say is what I'm fatty, but I discover me and another part of the world so it's not that fatty. I want to share with you the word that God has put in my spirit. This place is a little hot for me. So if you see me sweating, just need to know it's not the anointing. <laughs> it's the European heat. <laughs> Can you go to the Acts of the Apostles in chapter number 11? You love the word of God. Amen. Acts 11 from verse 19. Acts of the Apostles chapter 11 verse 19. I'm going to read a number of scriptures because many of you may not have read the Bible in a week. So Sunday morning is the time to read the Bible for you. We will read all the verses to compensate for the days you never read. Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch preaching the word to no one but to the Jews only. Verse 20, but some of them were men from Cy Cyprus and Cyrene, who when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. The news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. And when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all that with purpose of heart, they should continue with the Lord. Verse 24, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people are added to the Lord. Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he had found him, they brought him to Antioch, so it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people, and the disciples were first called who? Christians. Christians in Antioch. And in those days, or in these days, verse 27, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch, Then one of them named Agabus stood up and showed by the Spirit that there, there was going to be a great famine throughout the world which happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples each, according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. This they also did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. And may God bless his word. Can I read another verse in the Gospel of Luke chapter 19? The Gospel of Luke chapter 19. Verse 37. Public reading of scripture is important. The word is anointed. It's sharper than every two edged sword. Amen. To hear the reading of the word has a place in our lives as believers. Luke 19, that 7 says, Then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and to praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if this should keep silent, the stones will image the cry out. Mm. Put that in your spirit. Mm. This morning, I want to use these two texts of scripture in Acts 11 and Luke 19 and share with you a couple of things that are important because as I prayed and came into this place, I told God I want to speak a prophetic word to this church. When I say prophetic, what do you mean? I want to speak a word, a right now word. 
I want to speak something into your spirit that can help build you up so that you can become who God wants you to be at this time. And I want you to understand that the Holy Spirit is on the move every time. God has good plan for his people everywhere. He has a good plan for us in Kenya. He has a good plan for us here in Europe. And by the way, my coming into Europe has been part of the call of God in 2003, that's a few years ago, I was in the middle of somewhere in our nation and I was planting a church. And on that Sunday morning I was preaching to the villagers and we were declaring that today we have a church in this location. Mm -hmm. And right on the pulpit preaching with that translator translating the Swahili, which, was, which is one of our national languages, as I was preaching in English and somebody translating in Swahili, then in the spirit I saw a vision. And behind on the wall, I saw a huge banner written with these words, into Europe with passion. So I paused for the preaching. I said, hey, we are in the middle of Africa here, but God I just showed me something about Europe. And I said, God want me to begin to travel into Europe to preach the gospel. I didn't know anybody. I didn't have any contact. Nobody would invite me. But how many of you know if God wants you to go somewhere, nothing can stop it. Amen. Not even immigration. <laughs> if God wants you to go somewhere, nothing can stop it. Amen. Not even money can stop it. Amen. The devil can't do anything about it. Especially if you believe that all things are possible. Amen. Hallelujah. And I want you, you to know that all things are possible to two people only. One, to God, all things are possible. Amen. And secondly, all things are possible to the person who believes. Yes. Amen. That must be you and me, because we believe. And so I began a series of, uh, you know, open doors. One time I was preaching in New York and I got an email, somebody from Switzerland telling me, uh, you know, we are friends. We have met somewhere in the past, they said, and, and greeting each other. And then I, I remembered what God has said into Europe with passion. And so I wrote him, I said, hey, I need to come to your nation. He said, no, you can't come to Caesar. Here are things you plan one year ahead. And so we already know what's going to happen in 2016. So, you know, and so we don't have a plan for you to come here. I said, no problem, because God has another plan which is Amen. not your plan. Amen. After two months, the gentleman from uh, from Barcelon somewhere wrote me an email. He said, guess what? It looks like I need you to come in the next three months. Can you come? I said, I'm on my way. <laughs> and one Monday evening, I preached in a little village uh, called Oberdorf and you know, in a house of, with about 15 young people. And a lady who had been to Canada knew English translated for me. And seven young men, teenagers, were shaking as I preached. Just for about 20 minutes. And those seven boys gave their life to Christ that night. Yeah. The power of God changed them. They said, we've not seen it this way, this way. Today, after a couple of years, some of these young men are deacons in some churches around this country. And it opened a door for me to come over here and many other nations, and I bless the Lord. Jesus is Lord. Wherever his word is preached, Amen. he will move. Amen. Now, let me get to the message. We have read Acts 19, and I want you to know that you are in this nation, here in Geneva, because God has a plan to use you. Amen. Say, God has a plan to use me. God has a plan to use me. I usually preach moving around. Is it okay for me to keep moving? Yes. As long as I don't move out. <laughs> Say God has a plan to use me. God has a plan to use me. Thank you. You say, well, can he use a woman? Yeah, he can use anybody. <laughs> Hallelujah. Listen to me. When there was persecution, in the church in Jerusalem. The Bible shows that there was a young man called Saul of Tarsus 
who was obtaining letters from the religious community to persecute and harass the church. And that harassment rose up to a high level. They killed Stephen, who was a deacon. And Stephen was a man full of wisdom. He spoke great things, the whole of Acts chapter 7. And they could not resist his wisdom. And when he died, the Pharisees and the religious company were very happy. And they continued to harass the church. And Acts chapter 8, the Bible says, that the believers were scattered out of Jerusalem. They went to Judea and Samaria and other places. They had been told by Jesus in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 that you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit shall come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem. That means when you're doing it in Jerusalem, you also do it in Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. But what did not happen regarding Acts 1 8 had to happen in Acts 8 1. Ah. Acts 8 1 happened to fulfill Acts 1 8. Oh my God, you digital world, you already put my name on the screen. <laughs> These are the last days, I tell you. <laughs> Acts 1 8, you shall receive power of the Holy Spirit, you shall go to all the world. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. Acts 8 1, when there was persecution. They went to Judea and Samaria, which are the places they had been told to go. They went there because of persecution. I hope that pressure and the persecution and the harassment and trouble will not force you to do what God wants you to do. Please, do willingly what you need to do. Don't wait trouble to push you to do it. And when they went to these places, Judea and Samaria, there was one deacon called Philip, the evangelist. And the man brought joy in the city of Samaria. Demons were cast out. And many sick people were healed. The gospel of the kingdom was preached. Not the gospel of the church. The gospel of the kingdom was preached. That's another message. And many things happened in Samaria. And then Peter and John in Jerusalem heard the news of what happened in Samaria they came and they helped greatly and the work of God continued to expand. By Acts chapter 11 these believers, some of the other believers found themselves in an area called Antioch. They were, not, they were now very far away from Jerusalem. They were in Antioch in a new area. The Bible says when they got into this region of Antioch there are certain things they began to do. Look at you now from different parts of the world. Here in Geneva. This is your new Antioch. And while you're here, God is going to use you in this new Antioch. Amen. If you study the New Testament, and especially the book of Acts, and the writings of Paul the Apostle, you discover three major centers of Christian movement. Jerusalem church was a major center. Jerusalem. Later, Ephesus became a great center of Christian operation. And then Antioch was the newest place that God began to move. And he gathered a group of people in Antioch. The scripture said actually in Acts 13, the certain prophets and teachers gathered in Antioch ministering to the Lord in prayer and fasting and seeking the face of God. And from there, the Holy Spirit commissioned or set apart Barnabas and Saul for the work of the ministry. But before the leaders were commissioned, ordained, and set, up, set apart for the work, before the leaders came forth, there is something else we just read in Acts 11 that I want to show you, that this type of believers in Antioch were a special breed of people. And God is going to raise a type of a people like the ones we see in Antioch. I call them breakthrough believers. Now those who are writing notes, now you can write. <laughs> this guy is preaching about breakthrough believers. Uh, 
breakthrough believers. Let's look at these breakthrough believers and see what kind of people they were in Acts chapter 11. The Bible says a couple of things about them. And because faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The second hearing is very critical in you having faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing. So as I speak, it's not only that you're going to hear, I believe God, by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, as I speak these things, they will be registered in your spirit. God will be writing in your heart these things. The Bible says in verse 19 that when they traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, they went preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, after the persecution, the Bible says when they went to Judea and Samaria, they went preaching the word. When they are at Antioch, they went preaching the word. That tells me God is still raising believers in our day who will need to preach the word. God wants you to be a preacher. Ah, uh, no, some of you are saying, come on, no way, no way. I, no way, I, I can't preach. Listen, God is raising a generation in these last days to preach the word. Let me tell you something. When you look at the end, signs of end times, the world is so mesmerized by the beast and the earthquakes and famine and signs of the last days. You know that? But the Bible says in Matthew 24 verse 14 that in these signs you know that the, this, one of the greatest signs of the end time is that and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to all the nations of the world and then the end shall come. Right there. If I lie to you, this one will tell you the truth, right? <laughs> and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached, right? Then the end shall come. Somebody say the end shall come. Yes. The last thing that will happen to usher in the end is the preaching of the gospel. Forget about Satan and the beast and Antichrist. No, preaching the gospel is the last greatest movement on the earth before Jesus returns. It doesn't matter what the devil is doing. doesn't matter what the beast is doing. doesn't matter what new world order is doing from Geneva, New York. It doesn't matter what the devil is planning from wherever. The greatest activity that is going to be manifested on the earth is preaching the gospel. Amen. Oh my God. That tells me our economies in the world should support the preaching of the gospel in the last days. Those of us who are believers, we have no assignment in the last days other than participating in the preaching of the gospel. One of the greatest men that has been raised by God from Europe is called Raymond Bonke. He's written a book called, in the last, I think in the 90s, called Evangelism by Fire. He said, the word preach, preacher, preaching, appears in the New Testament 112 times. That word, only in six places where that word means preaching in terms of a discourse, a message with points and conclusion, as it were, theological message. The rest, 106 times, the word preach means to make an announcement. Pastor just made an announcement right here. And you threw the announcements on the screen. He could shout it. He could speak in a whisper. He could use bass, soprano, altar. He could use any, any kind of voice to make an announcement. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. You can also make an announcement. Amen. And let me tell you the greatest announcement of the year. When I went to Israel a couple of times, the first time there, 2008, they took us to work. It's uh, traditionally referred to as a grave where Jesus was buried. And there is an inscription at the door right there at the grave. How many of you want to know what is written at that door? Let me tell you what is written. It's written this. He is not here. Amen. <laughs> He's alive. He's alive. Jesus is alive. Amen. That's the greatest announcement you need to bring into your spirit. Hallelujah. 
and begin to share it with your mouth and let everybody you come across in this Geneva know that Jesus is alive. Amen. Preaching the gospel is what believers in Antioch did. Now you tell me, I can't preach. I, 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 I don't have the word. I don't have the message. I don't have the, I don't have the abilities and the skill. Look at verse 20. In this Acts 9, uh, 11, the Bible says, but some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene who came uh, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. They spoke. They spoke. They spoke. You can speak. You have a mouth to speak. You can speak about Jesus. If you can't preach, you can speak. Amen. Yeah, if you can't preach, you can speak. Yes. If you can't preach, you can speak. Those who could not preach, they spoke. Yes. Your mouth is not just for eating, it's for speaking. Amen. It doesn't matter your age, you can speak. Yes. And tell them Jesus is alive. Yes. Tell them Jesus loves them. Yes. Tell them Jesus has a plan for them. The devil hates them, but Jesus loves them. And he is able to heal them, save them, forgive them, touch their hearts and mold them to become something. They spoke. You can speak. These are breakthrough believers. But let me tell you something. When I entered into this hall right here this morning, the Holy Spirit put in my spirit something amazing. And I began to look at it in the scriptures. That's why I just read it in Luke chapter 19. When Jesus was entering Jerusalem, the last entry, he cried over the city. He looked at the city and he cried. He said, how I wish to gather you as a hen gathers our kicks, but you would not. You who stone and kill the prophets that are sent to you. You, your house will be left in desolation until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I've not come here as an African. I've come here as a prophet. I've come here with a word from God. And one of the things that I've had in the spirit in this congregation is that the enemy has been trying to silence your praise and silence your voice so that you don't say nothing about Christ. When they walked into Jerusalem on that little donkey, they put their, their clothes and garments on the streets. They sang Hosanna. They shouted glory to him in the highest. But guess what? The religious spirit in the elders, they told Jesus, rebuke your disciples, let them be quiet. Let them shut up. I hear here in Geneva, the enemy always say, silent, be quiet. Don't say nothing. You just continue with your life normally. Don't write nobody. Don't tell anybody about anything. Shut up. And there is a voice telling you, shut up. There is a voice telling you, be quiet. There is a spirit from hell. It's a religious spirit. Say, don't talk about Christ. Don't be too loud. Don't be too passionate. Just be no more ordinary, general, wonderful, nice man, nice woman. Be quiet. Eat your bread in quietness. Stay in your house. But the devil is a liar. Somebody is going to arise in the spirit. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1 verse 16, Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God Amen. unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jews and to the Greek. My God, for he innate, verse 17, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. I want you to know people of God in this place. You cannot be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. Oh my God. And Jesus said, Those of you shall be ashamed of me. I shall be ashamed of them before my father. Those who cannot confess me before men, I shall not confess them before my father. But those who shall confess me before men, I shall confess them before my Father in heaven. I want you to know, in this season, we are in a prophetic time. A time when God would want the Christians in Geneva not to allow the enemy to silence them. Jesus said, if these my disciples are quiet, the stones are going to cry out. Oh my God. 
I don't know anywhere in the world where there are many stones like Europe. Look at all these buildings and so much concrete everywhere, even the roads and tarmac. Praise God, Africa has some roads without tarmac. <laughs> so, so we have some places where it's only the soil. And I'm sure in Asia, but here in Europe, you have most of the places that are so much stone. So there are enough stones <laughs> to cry out. But, <laughs> Like a man in America who sang a song, Ron Kennedy sang a song in the 90s, I will let no rock praise him on my behalf. I will let no rock cry out in my place. I will not allow the stones to cry out to the Lord and praise the Lord on my behalf. I will use my praise and declare that Jesus is alive. Amen. Right now in this service, Every one of you that has been ashamed and been silent, you no longer testify of the Lord. You are no longer a witness of Christ. You are a general Christian by name, by association, by family, by heritage. That is not enough. God would want you to be a witness who is not ashamed. This is what is going to change your nation. This is what is going to change your place. And let me tell you, it doesn't matter whether you are born here. Even this man in Antioch was not born there. They were taken there by circumstances beyond what they could handle. But they found themselves in Antioch. Here you find yourself in Geneva. I want you to know, in this place, you will preach Christ and you will speak to the people the word of God. And nothing should silence you. In the marketplace, in the workplace, in the houses, on the streets. I know laws and culture and modernism, modernism and society has allowed us the little thing we can do, maybe is hand out some trucks and give them some people, some stuff on the street and just hope they will read. Praise God. This is a reading culture. They read everything. But let me tell you something. The gospel of Christ must be spoken by somebody. And you are the generation God is going to use. But I see a power that has silenced many of you. This year, 2015, we are now in the month of June. You haven't told anybody since the year began that Jesus is Lord. And you still claim you're Christian. There is something wrong. I'm here this morning to let you know I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to ask God to send fire, passion, love, Holy Spirit, grace, whatever you call it. You need the help. Jesus must begin to boil inside of you. Amen. One time there was a young man called David. He was anointed by someone. Let's hope he was 17 years. Taking care of the sheep. And he went back to take care of the sheep. He was anointed. But he went back to take care of the sheep. The sheep did not need the anointing. He was anointed. He went back to take the sheep. The sheep did not need the anointing. The only thing he could do. Get his tennis. His stringed instrument and begin to play and to worship and to bless the Lord. But one day, his father sent him to take soup to his brothers in the battlefield. And they found there was a moment of, you know, holding at the mountain and the soldiers were not fighting for 40 days. There was a man called Goliath standing and cursing God's people. And as David arrived, he remembered the anointing that Samuel had placed upon him. He boiled inside of him. He heard the cursings and the words that Goliath spoke. And, uh, you know, that cast is right. And David felt fire. He said that something can be done. He went to Saul and said, what shall be done to the men who shall take off this Goliath? You must be the generation that is going to slay the giants. I said to you, you must be ready and agree and accept to become a giant killer. Now in Kenya, we have a tribe called the Maasai. They kill the lions. Maybe you have seen on YouTube the two Maasai guys who take meat from the lion. Oh my God. It's there in the YouTube. You'll find it. Yeah. The lion is eating something. We can't go hungry when the lions are eating. If ordinary men can do that, you must be extraordinary by the spirit of the living God. 
and slay the giants that hinder you from being what God wants you to be. And David felt an anointing rise up within him. And he asked King Saul, what shall be done to the man who shall take this Goliath? David was a breakthrough man. And I want to believe God with you as I pray this morning that something will happen to you. Glory to God. I say glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. I know it's 12 o'clock and you want to go home, but I was told to preach until tomorrow. So <laughs> you are in trouble today. <laughs> Give me a few minutes, a few minutes of a preaching. Let me tell you a couple of things that are important. The Bible says, when this man in verse 21 of Acts 11 were in Antioch, the hand of the Lord was with them. Breakthrough believers are those who know and the hand of God is with them. Amen. Let me tell you how you're going to be successful in your Christian life. The hand of God is upon you. Amen. When you are alone, you are weak. When you are alone, you can't do much. But if the hand of God is upon you, Amen. oh my God, you shall do exploits. Amen. What do you mean by the hand of God? The hand of God represents many things in the Bible. Particularly the power of God, the might of God, the spirit of might. The hand of God is a strong head. One time there was a young man called Nehemiah who walked in the state house, in the big house in, in Babylon. And he heard of the trouble of the build of the wall in Jerusalem being burned down. And he said, I'm going to go and build the wall in Jerusalem. He talked to the king. He got leave. He got letters and permission. And he was allowed by the king to go and rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. But he gathered his elders, the elders of Israel, to tell them of what had happened. And that he has favor and that he has been given permission. The Bible says in Nehemiah, he told the elders of the good hand of God that was upon him. That allowed him and gave him favor to be released to go and build the wall. One man had a vision to build a whole city. Wow. One man can build a whole city. You can change Geneva as one man. One man like Nehemiah could go and build the city, the wall of Jerusalem. One man. Oh my God. Our God is still the same God. Amen. Of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen. One church like this can rock and shift things in the spirit in Geneva. Amen. If the hand of God is upon you. I declare today, may the might of God, may the hand of God rest upon you, in your business, in your family, in your house. May you see God's might. When you are strong, weak, then you are strong. Let the weak say, I am, I am strong. Glory to God. I want you to know the hand of God was upon these believers in Antioch. Listen. And because the hand of God was upon them, a great number believed and turned to the Lord. In other words, God used them to bring people to God. God will use you in this your new Antioch to be a man of impact and influence. Oh my God. If people can be influenced by witchcraft, you can be influenced by the Holy Spirit. If the devil can influence people, Heaven will influence you. Amen. And if heaven will influence you and impact you, then with that power of the Holy Spirit, you will impact your region and your city and your nation. You are going to be a breakthrough believer. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. Oh, when the news of this came to the ears of the people in Jerusalem, they said, Barnabas, come, go to Antioch and see those wonderful believers. Go and see those in Geneva. Go and see what they are doing. Go and see what's going on. We hear good things are happening. May your news reach the rest of the world. May God do something in Geneva. I stand here as a prophet of God. And last year, God allowed me to preach in a city called Canberra in Australia. When I was there for the first time, I asked the Lord, show me what I'm going to say to the nation of Australia from the capital city called Canberra. And in a dream that night, I saw a huge serpent that was intertwined and holding the whole city and the people of Australia. I said, my God, the spirit of witchcraft 
bites this nation. And that morning I preach that gospel and I say this power of each crowd will be broken on a camera. And God gave me an opportunity to speak on radio to all the people in the nation. They gave me five minutes. They said, preacher, you have five minutes. When I began to speak the God on the on the radio screen, she forgot. It was 45 minutes. <laughs> the screen went on hibernation. She began to take notes of what I was saying. She had to call the post and on the screen, hibernated. I, I, you know, the computer, it, it went off. She didn't know where we were. They are not eating to cover the radio station. People are saved. People are delivered. People are filled with the Holy Spirit. The power of God hit the place. Listen to me. I came to Geneva. And I said this is a city of reformation. The reformers were here. That's why Geneva is a major international city. Many major organizations are here. Because the reformers came from here. In these last days, there's going to be a new reformation. A new move of God. You generation that live here in Geneva, I say to you, a new church will arise. A new people will arise with a passion for God. A people like we find in Antioch, the hand of God was upon them. But those people must be willing to speak the word and declare Jesus is Lord. They will discover the hand of God is upon them. And guess what? They will be successful. Many shall be brought to the Lord. You will succeed. The devil may be telling you you are not successful. The devil may be telling you, look at you, you are weak and small. The devil may be showing you, you don't know what it takes. But I declare the word of God. God will turn around your story. God will turn around your life. God will turn around what you do. I declare now by the power of the Holy Ghost. Right now as I speak, because I'm about to pray, something is going to happen. The Holy Spirit will move things. I say to you, you will succeed. The Bible says, the news of this man reached all over Jerusalem. They sent Barnabas to Antioch. Look at verse 23. The Bible says when he came and he saw the grace of God, he was glad. He saw the men and women of God in Antioch had the grace of God upon them. These breakthrough believers are believers who are moving in the grace of God. Grace is unmerited. Grace, there's nothing you can do about it. God just decide to look at you. He loves you. He likes you. He favors you. He says he's going to work with you. Amen. The world may have looked at you and said you are nothing. You don't look good. You don't qualify. You don't have the papers. You don't have a good name. You don't have the right age. But God looks at you from heaven. He favors you. He looks at you. He favors you. His praise is upon you. Uh, in a father's day like this, you may have been raised without a father. And you have missed many things in life. But we have a father in heaven. Amen. He's our father. He loves you. He cares for you. He thinks well of you. And he can turn around your story. And everything upside down. Are you aware that God uses the nobodies of this world to make them somebody's? If he can raise a boy like me, shoeless boy, without clothes and everything from Africa, and raise me up to be a blessing all over the world. I want you to know if he did it for me, he can do it for you. He can do it for anybody. He is a good God. But now I saw the grace of God. The grace of God was upon me. Somebody say the grace of God is going to be upon me. What did Manabas do? He encouraged them. He strengthened them. He told them with the purpose of heart, you should continue with the law. I'm here to tell you, continue with God. Don't quit. Don't go back. Don't backslide. Be a forward strider. Amen. Don't lose your vision. Keep moving with God. Don't give up. Keep moving ahead. The honor is on you and me. Uh, the Bible said, through many tribulations, we shall still possess the kingdom. Though there may be trouble, God is still with us. Amen. So Barnabas came and encouraged us. He told them, look, you ran away from your places and you came into Antioch. Some of you ran from Philippines. Some of you ran from Asia, from Africa. You ran from other European nations. I don't know where you ran from. Maybe you ran from another part of Switzerland and you're here by divine grace. Look at you now. Though you are here, I say to you, continue in the grace of God. Amen. Continue in the things of the kingdom. 
God is with you and he is on your side. Amen. And the Bible says this Barnabas was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and is a man of faith. And uh, many people are led to the Lord. In other words, Barnabas came in to bring a help. And when he came in, something happened. Later, we will not finish this story because we don't have time. We'll continue before Jesus returns. <laughs> a good preacher is the one who doesn't finish the message. <laughs> Barnabas came in, and when he came in, these believers got some leadership. Barnabas felt, we need some help. We need some apostolic innovation. He went all the way to Tarsus and picked one called Saul, who had gotten converted and was hiding. He brought him to Antioch. And when they came, all of a sudden, Antioch became another place. Let me tell you, man of God, as you continue to rise up, God will send you the Barnabas, sons of encouragement. Soon, he will bring the soul of Tarsus, who will later become Paul. This Antioch center will begin to rise and to grow. Amen. Within a short time, this will become a church where now when you're ministering to the Lord, the Holy Spirit will pick the ones he wants and he will commission them to the nations. May God raise a church in Geneva. Amen. An Antioch apostolic church. A church that is going to raise missionary, passionate people who can share the good news of the kingdom all over the world. Amen. You are the first people to make it happen. Amen. By your prayer. By your giving. By your fasting. By your faith. By your passion. By your commitment. By your sacrifices. Amen. All things are possible. Amen. Things are going to happen. Ah, I want to pray. I want to pray right now. Well, many times when we begin to pray, we say, oh, keyboard man, go on the piano, begin to play. You have no piano, you are a young church. Don't worry. <laughs> God has many pianos in the kingdom. Amen. Oh, you want to play some music? That's okay. When you just begin to say, God, you're going to use me yeah. in these last days. We bless you, God. We exalt your holy name. We magnify you, Jehovah. There is no one like you. You deserve the glory and the praise. You are the mighty God. You are the holy God. You are the blessed Redeemer. The one who was, who is, and is to come. You are beautiful God, beyond description. Can somebody open your mouth and tell God something you believe? Telling you are the almighty God. You are the great I am. You are the healer. You are the deliverer. You are the savior. You are the life giver. You are the one who blesses me. You are the one who sets me free. You are the one who comes out the grave. You are the one who comes out there. Oh Jesus. Thank you that you are the same yesterday. You are the same today and you are the same forever. Whatever you did in the past, you are still doing it today. And you are the same even tomorrow. Father, I give you the praise and the glory. Worship your holy.
I thank you for the power of the gospel. I thank you, Jesus, that you died on the cross. I thank you when you died, they buried you. I thank you after three days you rose from the dead. I thank you that you are still the good news to humanity. You are the answer to the world. I thank you that you are the solution to human trouble. Jesus Christ, by the hearing of faith, things happen. I pray right now that you begin to do unusual things in our midst. Let the sick begin to be healed right now. Every power of darkness you are under my feet. Every witchcraft, religion, failure, spirit of darkness you are under my feet. I declare Satan you are defeated. Jesus is Lord. And that mighty things are going to happen in this place. For he who believes. Oh my God I give you the praise. I give you the glory. Thank you that there is forgiveness. There is salvation on the cross. And here in Geneva right now this morning, there is a help. Jesus, you are still forgiving. You are still saving. You are still setting free. You are still giving peace. You are still giving salvation. You are still giving people a new chance. You are still restoring men and women. You are still saving. You are still healing. You are still delivering. My God, You are still raising the dead. Jesus, you are still doing. And right now we believe. We believe. Before I pray any other kind of prayer, can I ask anyone in this service that does not know Jesus as Lord and Savior? You have never opened your heart to the Lord. You are religious, you are good, you go to church, that's great. Thank God you are here. But if you died today, you have no hope of eternal life. You will be lost forever. But today, you can give your life to Christ and say, Jesus, forgive me. I can't help myself. I can't solve my problems. Jesus, you are the one who died for me. You are the one who did it for me. And I want to pray right now. Anyone in this place that is saying, Preacher, I want to open my heart to the Lord Jesus and ask him to forgive me. If you want a prayer, I'm going to pray with you. Maybe you have never done it. It's your first time. You can do it now. Oh, you did it, then you lost your faith, you lost your walk with God, you became a general person who has no faith, you are ashamed of Christ, but today you want to say, I want to restore my life, I want to stand for Christ, I want to be known that I'm part of the family of God, I want to know that I know that I know that I have a relationship with Jesus. If you want that kind of prayer to be born again, you need to be hand up pray with you right now. God bless you. God bless you. I see your hands. You are saying, Jesus, I want to be born again. God bless you. I want eternal life. God bless you. I see your hands. You that are lifting up your hands, stand up on your feet. If you are lifting up your hands, stand up on your feet where you are. It's time to be saved. It's time to be born again. It's time to give Jesus your life. It's time to know that God loves you. It's time to confess Christ. It's time to give your life to him. This is your new Antioch. You'll be added to the church and to the faith. Jesus is still the Savior, the healer, the salvation giver. Father, I give you praise for salvation today. I bless your holy name. I give you honor and praise. I'm going to be praying for the sick, but before I pray for the sick, and pray for miracles, signs, and wonders to happen, because they happen everywhere the gospel is preached. The greatest miracle is a miracle of salvation. Amen. It's a miracle of repentance. It's a miracle of giving your life and your heart to Christ. That's what you're standing up to do. This is the greatest day of your life. Jesus will never forsake you. He will love you to the very end. He will give you new life. Father, I give you praise. Would you, you guys that are standing up, come and, come and stand here with me. Uh, it's a sign of faith that you're standing here with the preacher. Come and line up here. Let's ask Jesus to come into your heart. Very young man, maybe that that's good. You want to give a lot to Jesus? Awesome. Just line up. What a blessed day it is. What a wonderful day it is. Yes, I don't know that. That's good. That's good. What a beautiful day it is. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, blessed God. Romans chapter 10 asks, how can one be saved? 
Shall we go up to heaven and bring him down, Christ? Shall we go to the grave and bring him up? Where is he? The Bible says in Romans 10, 8, the word is near thee, even in your mouth. It's a word of faith which you preach. And what does it say? That if you believe with your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, you shall be saved. You believe with your heart and you confess with your mouth, you will be saved. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the time. I want to pray and ask Jesus to come into your heart. And I'll pray with you. You will pray with me. Let's make this prayer your prayer and my prayer. Let me make it our prayer. Would you pray this prayer with me? Say out loud from your heart. Let it be your kind of prayer. Say, dear Lord Jesus Christ. Today I've heard your word. And I open my heart to you. I know I'm a sinner. But I stand before you. I ask you to forgive my sins. I ask you to save me. Today I believe. With my heart. And now I'm confessing with my mouth. That Jesus, you are Lord. Jesus, you are the Son of God. I confess you are the Son of God. 